Hello everybody and welcome to the next topic on the Western Civilization 2 CLEP test, the English Civil Wars. And sorry to my about 20 subscribers here for uh, not getting another video out there very quickly. I was kind of busy just sending my master's applications out to the UK because I just had finished up my bachelor's degree back in May. Uh, if you're new here and you didn't know this yet, basically what I did is I used CLEPS and DSST testing to test out of college. I did a four year bachelor's degree in about a year and five months. In the process, I've saved about another $80,000, and I actually wrote a book on the topic, so if you are interested in getting that, I have left a link in the description, so you can go get that. And yes, I will do a promotion for my book in every video. No, I'm not ashamed of it. Um, just so you guys know, my information on this video is extremely detailed. What are you, a fag? Um, do not try to remember all of this information. There's no need to remember all of this information either. I think just with the overall detail, having excessive amount of detail on it, that will help you just retain the smaller overall view of the information a little bit better. Also, I left a quiz in the description after you watch the video if you want to just test uh, to see how well you retain some of the knowledge. Um, just so you guys know, the English Civil Wars are the precursor to the American Revolution, and here's what I mean by this. Um, it was the first time anybody ever rebelled against the king, and like we discussed in the last video with Absolutists, kings thought they were God-chosen. It was the divine right of kings. And so how this war ends, I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler here, is the king, uh, King Charles I, is decapitated and killed, uh, which is, I mean, it's kind of fun. It makes history a little bit more fun when people die. So to fully grasp this war, we have to go a few years before, and by a few I mean like 20 or 30, uh, to King James I, the start of the Stuart dynasty in England. So James wanted to unite England and Scotland to form one united kingdom, and the House of Commons, or a better word for them would be Parliament, said that that was a bad idea, that we shouldn't be doing that, and James bypassed them and decided to go on anyway. And actually speaking to which, one of the members of parliament actually said, if we let the Scots into heaven, we might as well let the devil in too. I mean, in their defense, let, let's be honest here, Scottish people. Right, don't put too much weight on it, right? Wait, what the fuck am I meant to put my weight? Wait, right, I can't put my weight in the roof, it's dead fun. I can't hold on to the meant to do that. Oh, you don't do what for five minutes? You fucking wank Steve. And despite the House of Commons disagreeing with them, James went on and united uh, England and Scotland as one, being King James the first of England and King James the. I don't know, 6th or 7th Scotland, it's, it's not really relevant which one he was. But in this process, uh, now that the Scots were English citizens, English people still thought of themselves as England and treated the Scottish as second-class citizens. King James I didn't even realize in this whole process that the Scots didn't even want to be part of England. He just thought, oh, it'd be great to unite everybody, but in reality it didn't even work. And I think the big part of this too that you have to kind of understand is that with Scotland, Scotland's already divided amongst hundreds of thousands of clans um, and they united as Scotland and those clans even still exist today and it's there's still a huge cultural divide even though they've been part of England for 200 some odd years now and James was thinking that he was the quote-unquote ultimate unifier in reality was just kind of the unifier of people who really hate him and his son Charles the first but unifying people to hate you uh, doesn't really work out well for you sometimes does it Charlie so when Charlie took over, he started taxing the people to shit, which led to this thing called the Petition of the Right. Now, the Petition of the Right was a document written up by Parliament in 1628, uh, which was just the precursor to restricting the king of his powers. Um, and it broke it down into four main points. So here they are, I'll put them on the screen too. Uh, no taxes could be present without Parliament's consent. No English subjects could be imprisoned without cause. No quartering of soldiers in citizens' homes and no martial law in peacetime. Now, some people argue that this is a precursor to the U.S. Declaration of Independence, but there aren't a lot of similarities between the documents themselves because it was government versus the people uh, in American Revolution, while this one was more government versus different form of government. However, either way, it was a really good catalyst to bringing down the king from his high pedestal. For those of you who don't know, the English Parliament was split into two different categories, uh, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. House of Commons is ruled by the common people or just normal people. People, and then the House of Lords is ruled by the nobility. And normally before the Petition of the Right, the houses would just do everything the king asked them to do. Uh, they were there just, just there to make the people feel better and feel more comfortable that the king wasn't doing as much. But this was the first time in a while that the parliament actually rebelled against the king. What the main issue was is that King Charles would actually raise taxes, and if you didn't pay them, he would put you in prison. For what? Arresting me for what? 
I'm not allowed to stand up for myself! Schiller Wright came into being because it was saying that the king was actually going against Magna Carta, which was a document written back in the 1200s, and habeas corpus as well, uh, which was just kind of putting... Uh, history on the back burner. And initially Charles disagreed with this because he thought Parliament was just doing it because they wanted more power, but in reality they were just trying to take power away from Charles. And so his original refusal uh, didn't change anything, they just uh, continued not to back down and eventually Charles had to sign it in 1628. After it was implemented, um, in reality it really didn't change anything at all, uh, he just kept going on taxing people and the, everything got worse. Now when Charlie became king, the Scots actually broke away from the English church because they absolutely hated him. And one of the biggest things for any Christian in this time period is when you break away from the Christian church and form your own Christian church. Uh, that's one of the worst things you can ever do. So Charlie was really hated by everybody after that because he undid all of daddy's hard work. Following that, he decided to declare war on the Scots in a war called the First Bishop's War, in which like every war Charles fought as well, he lost. And one of the biggest issues, and this issue actually continues on into the English Civil War as well, so I'm just gonna explain it now, is called Militia Armies. And so if you look at a map of England and you look down in the Kent region over here, um, a person from Kent in a militia army will only want to fight for Kent because they're not getting paid, they're not fighting for England, they're fighting for their area. I don't want people coming in here. So if there's ever an issue over there, they'll fight there. But the second the army has to go move out of that area, they lose all of their troops that were fighting from Kent. Um, and this just continues all the way up. So in reality, you're not fighting England versus Scotland, you're fighting uh, Yorkshire versus Scotland at the best. And part of the reason people did this is they couldn't afford a real army. Um, they might be able to afford the tools and stuff like that, but Charlie couldn't afford an army. That was the big problem. And the Scots could afford an army, so they, they beat him off pretty easily. So when it came time, about April of 1640, the king was completely broke, and he called his first parliament for, uh, since 1629. But this is a, an 11-year gap of no parliament. For those of you who don't have a respect for how long this 11 years is, let's put this in perspective for you. 11 years ago, Saddam Hussein was hung. Also, cars came out. One. Cars One came out 11 years ago. So the parliament has about 11 years of qualms with the king, which a lot of which are, you didn't follow the petition to the right, why are you taxing people? And so these 11 years of qualms, they refuse to give and allow any money to the king until he would actually listen to their issues. Uh, and this parliament is called the short parliament because it only lasted a couple days. So order broke down all over England, so kind of like now. Uh, and the people were angry because they were paying way too much in taxes. For those of you who don't know this, historically speaking, when you tax people more, it does not mean you have more money. Um, it actually just means that you're ignorantly spending that money more often. Um, if you look at the United States, there's still uh, people where people are getting taxed quite a bit and we're still, I don't know, $19 trillion in debt. Uh, Charles then got desperate and asked the city of London, I don't know why, but uh, he asked them for more money and of course they refused. And then the Scottish army began marching south, started the, starting the Second Bishop's War of 1640. They took one really piece of shit city in England called Newborn, which really doesn't have much going on in it. Charles then gets super scared and then pays them tons of money to pay 850 pounds per day to have the Scottish army exist. Um, if this doesn't sound that bad to any of you British people, that's back in the 1600s. A modern day equivalent in US dollars is $202,962.07 per day in 2017. It's a lot of money because Charlie was, well, a fuck up. Uh, he was forced to call another parliament, but this one had to sit the entire way through so he can actually make money. And this one was called the Long Parliament and it never ended until 1653. So what Charlie's ultimate goal in this was, was to fund the Scottish army by paying that $202,000 equivalent, so 850 pounds a day, uh, to the Scottish army by paying off their enemy's army. He then wanted to raise enough money to start his own army against the army he's paying for and then beating them so he doesn't have to pay them anymore. And so Parliament still wanted their older qualm resolved, which was lower taxes. Now it's, it's in the 1640s, and it's about uh, 11 to 12 years after uh, the Petition of the Right was already signed. So Charlie Boy wanted uh, some immediate money, and the only way he could do that was by taxing the people to death. Um, and Parliament wanted lower taxes, so things are kind of contradicting each other right now. And Parliament also didn't want Charles to disband them for any reason whatsoever, so Parliament created this new law 
which uh, basically said you cannot disband parliament as the king. Um, in addition to this, they were required to be called into session every three years, which isn't very much um, when you look at modern times and how often these people are called into office. Um, but this, this is a, a big deal for them back then. Um, in this treaty as well, abolishing the courts uh, from the rulings of the king was also implemented. So in other words, um, the king couldn't just control the courts with whatever he wanted to. And people couldn't be wrongfully imprisoned for not being able to afford his extremely high tax rate. Charlie had to actually get rid of two of his biggest advisors uh, named Thomas Wentworth and William Law. Um, but however, Thomas Wentworth, who was the Earl of who the fuck cares, um, and part of the House of the Lords is actually given an attainder, which sounds like a good thing, but it's absolutely not. An attainder means that he was refused a trial and then found guilty immediately. The execution was in 1641. And with all of this going on, Parliament actually fixed the financial problem, which is kind of bizarre. Now the king was forced to agree with everything, because if he didn't, then it would just show how much he really was a pathetic king. Charlie kind of tricked himself into thinking that if he just kept letting them do everything, that everybody would be like, oh, these guys are psychopaths, let's get rid of the parliament and put the king back into power. Um, but parliament was saving them tons of money, so I don't think they would really care at that point. Um, and then Parliament created a bunch of laws called the Radical Proposal of uh, 1641. Uh, so now uh, the House of Commons was actually split on all of the issues after this point. And uh, things got so intense at points, people actually pulled out their swords and threatened to murder other people in the, the, the parliamentary bill. The final result on the radical proposals was 159 votes for the Grand Remonstrance, 148 against. These 148 eventually formed the Royalist Party and the other 159 formed Parliamentarians. Uh, so now real quick, we're going to hop over to Ireland um, and talk about their issue behind the whole Civil War as well. So there is this Irish Catholic revolution against the English Protestants and it killed about 12,000 uh, English Protestants. However, in London, the number that was being spread around was about 200,000. Um, and this actually created more anger for the English parliamentarians uh, against the royalists because they saw the king not doing anything. And in turn to this, parliament then removed all of the king's responsibilities minus naming the head of the military. Basically, Parliament offered him a free retirement plan, kind of like the Queen of England now. All right, but anyway, he got really pissed, and uh, he gathered a bunch of troops together, and they stormed into the parliamentary building. Um, and so the leader of the Parliament at this time, his name was Pym. Um, he heard about this, and he figured it was going to happen, so he bailed with a bunch of the other leaders of Parliament um, and ran away, which kind of made... Charles looked really stupid, and so Charles got really annoyed, uh, so much so that he had to cool down, and he went up to York to cool down. Uh, during this time, both sides began arming themselves, the parliamentarians and the royalists, getting ready for a, a big all-out war between each other. And then on August 22nd of 1642, um, if those of you who don't know what that date is, um, it's the actual, it's the anniversary of the Battle of Bosworth Field, uh, where the War of the Roses ended uh, by killing Richard III, um, and now putting on the Tudor dynasty, which led to King Henry VIII and Elizabeth and Bloody Mary. But on that date, uh, Charles I declared war on Parliament. So that'll lead to the actual English Civil Wars. But before I get into that, um, real quick, I just want to make something very clear. Remembering the dates and the time periods is not important. It's especially not important for these tests. I know it, you think it would be important, but it's actually not. And one of the biggest things is the fact that the English Civil Wars, or not just the English Civil Wars, but any time in history, the time and the dates are only meant for uh, knowing when things are happening in what order. Uh, they're not, you don't have to know, oh, in 1642 this happened and all this stuff. Just know when things kind of came about and roughly how long things lasted. Uh, so when you see like a big event on the news, like, I don't know, Columbine, you don't necessarily remember the day. At the time, you're not thinking, oh my god, all these kids died. It's April 20th, 1999. You're thinking, oh, all these kids died. That's so terrible. Why did all these kids die? And so that's what the, the difference is, is that you just have to know what actually happened. That's more important. Um, just to show you guys real quick, I have one of my favorite quotes here. 
Instruction in world history in the so-called high schools is even today a very sorry condition. Few teachers understand that the study of history can never be to learn historical dates and events by heart and recite them. That what matters is not whether the child knows exactly when the battle or that was fought, uh, when a general was born, or even when a monarch, usually a very un insignificant one, came into the crown for his forefathers. No, by the living God, this is very unimportant. To learn history means to seek and to find the forces which are the causes leading to the effects which we subsequently perceive as historical events. Hey, I like that quote. Uh, who said that? Okay. All right, so that being said, the English Civil Wars lasted from 1642 to 1649. And in the first English Civil War, there were two sides, and in, in the second one as well, but the, there's the Royalists and the Parliamentarians. Um, the Royalists were also known as the Cavaliers and the Parliamentarians as the Roundhead. It, Cavaliers comes from like the Spanish word for horse. The round heads is because they had short hair, so I, I guess their head was round because of that. I don't know. I have a pretty round head, so I don't. So the royalists actually, um, their biggest thing was it wasn't that they agreed with the king. It was just that they thought all hell would break loose if there was no king. They typically came from the north and the west, um, which were typically the poorest parts of the country at the time. In other words, uh, low, less education, higher support for the king. Um, however, they were also supported by the nobles and the gentry who were, ironically, the wealthiest parts of society. So uh, next on with the parliamentarians or the roundheads, something to make very clear. They didn't necessarily um, want to abolish the monarchy. They just didn't like the current king in place, and they wanted a, a sort of impeachment to get a new king in, in, into power. And even if they didn't want to abolish the monarchy or, or this specific monarch, they just wanted him to follow the rules more, which he would never do. And a big part of the thing was is they were scared that he was trying to make England Roman Catholic. And we all know that we can't be no pesky Roman Catholics, don't we? So the Roundheads typically came from the South and the East. Uh, they were mostly merchants, lawyers, um, the other half of the gentry, um, and the common folk. Not the poor, but more like a modern-day middle class. Um, religious followings were mostly Puritan, which is why uh, what happens after the English Civil War, which goes to hell. I'll talk about that in another video and non-materialist Anglican churchgoers. Now, if you want to look historically at any major war um, that lasts more than a week or that uh, is not guerrilla tactics, basically um, how the war will always play out is whoever has the better material sources will always win the war. In this case, if you look at the parliamentarian and royalist borders, um, the north and the west versus the south and the east, the south and east consists of London, is a huge economic benefit, as well as being on the English Channel. And the fact that they're on the English Channel has a direct line to the rest of Europe, mainland Europe, so they, they have a great economic standing and a great way to compete against the Royalists. Um, and you can see this time and time again throughout history. If you look at the American Civil War, um, the South had all of the greatest generals. They had Robert E. Lee, uh, Stonewall Jackson. The North really didn't have anybody worth note until after the war. Um, and one of the biggest things with that is that the North had a great material wealth that the South just didn't have. The South was mostly farms. To start off, there was uh, the King's nephew, Rupert of the Rhine, um, who was the Royalist, and then the Parliamentarian was a man by the name of Oliver Cromwell, which we'll get into a little bit further later. Um, and they had the first major battle of the war, which was at Edge Hill, um, and that one was actually won by the Royalists. And the Royalists, after this point, kept fighting from Edge Hill all the way to London. But in the process of doing so, uh, Charlie kept trying to go back to the beginning of the fighting and killing off those people who were fighting him in, in the places that he already won instead of marching forward to, and into London. And doing this, um, he got right up to the base of London and then failed um, and then uh, got pushed back. Because of this, Prince Rupert, I don't know why, but I have a feeling he was just like really whiny. But he is stopped at Turnham Green, just outside of London, um, and this was a huge win for the parliamentarians. Um, but even with his victory, Parliament was desperate for help. Um, so back to the militia armies again. Um, if you want to know more about that, I, I put it. I put it back earlier in the video. Um, so if you skipped it, you can just go back and watch that. Um, basically, the militia armies, um, their big flaw 
ruined a lot of parliamentary uh, fighting tactics. This wasn't just for parliament, um, but it was also the royalists too. They both had this issue of using town militias as opposed to actually having an army that they paid for. So the guy I mentioned before, John Pym, who was uh, the leader of the parliamentarians, um, he negotiated this thing called the Solemn League and Covenants with the Scots. So the Scots would supply their army, which was just, they just fought in the two bishops wars that I mentioned earlier. Um, and in the process of doing so, uh, they would have to pay 30,000 pounds per month to the army. Um, and also after they won, they had to convert all of England to Presbyterianism. All right, so the Scottish army was used to defeat the Royalists at Marston Moor in Yorkshire, which is up in the north. Um, this battle was led by Oliver Cromwell, who is the cavalier, um, who used a new battle tactic. <sighs> Before this point, uh, horsemen would charge through the enemy lines and then uh, be done with the battle. Oliver Cromwell revolutionized the idea to, instead of running away, turn around and run back. I really don't know why no one thought about this beforehand. It seems like a, a very easy tactic to think up. Oliver Cromwell came up with the revolutionary idea of turning around. Uh, so, but back on the economic front, in order for the parliamentarians to pay the Scottish army, they began taxing people for alcohol, uh, tobacco, and other things, which it pissed people off because the parliament went to war over high taxes, and then they started raising their taxes on people. Um, but anyway, they were taxing them even more so than Charles was. However, in 1645, it actually paid off because they could now fund an army of their own, um, which was called the New Model Army. So a few things about the new model army it was it was a national army, which got rid of the local militia problem that I was explaining before. Um, it was a professional army as well, staffed by officers chosen by merit and not birth. Um, the soldiers were also paid regularly, which made them kind of want to stay more. Um, it was a godly army, which was kind of different, but that was big, a big deal to them. Uh, it's a godly army, mostly dominated by Puritans. Its commander was a man by the name of Thomas Fairfax, who's really not that important, and its cavalry commander was uh, the revolutionary Oliver Cromwell. So the uh, new model army met the Royalist army in 1645 at the Battle of Naseby. Uh, Prince R Rupert's cavalry broke through didn't turn around, and that's why they lost, because Oliver Cromwell, fucking bastard, turned around. <laughs> Turning around ended the First English Civil War. <laughs> um, about 180,000 people died in this process. Um, back then, this is actually a lot of people. 180,000 people is a lot of people. That was 3.6% of the population of England. Um, if you think about that, that that's that's a good portion considering all of them were also men, too. So uh, that's about 6%, 7% of the male population of England. So uh, it's just over uh, 120 men that you know died in this war. Now, the biggest problem came down to this, is that after the war was over, the king didn't get executed yet. Um, he, he was just given a uh, right to do whatever he wanted again. So he was put back in the same way, and even though he lost the war, nothing changed. He was still the king. I want to quote the Earl of Manchester real quick, who said, If we beat the king 99 times, he would be king still and his posterity, and we his subjects still. But if he beat us but once, we should be hanged and our posterity undone. In other words, if the king lost the war a, a thousand times, a billion times, he would still be king. But if they lost even one time, um, they, they, would they would all be hung. Um, so because of this, Charlie then bar bided his time and waited it out to be able to afford uh, a new army. And he, uh, he got the Scottish army to turn to his side for uh, converting to Presbyterianism. Um, but again, with this revolutionary tactic of Turning around, uh, the war started and it was over pretty much immediately. Um, it ended in Preston, England up in the north, and Cromwell destroyed the Scots. Um, so what this did is Parliament then decided to try the king for treason, um, so he could not do this to the people anymore. Um, now this is an odd concept, because at this time, uh, what treason didn't mean uh, that you were against your country, it meant that you were um, against your king. So the king could never commit treason because he'd be committing treason against himself. 
So the trial of treason was being against the people. It was, uh, they were trying to redefine the term of treason, which was a, a new thing to them. Um, but since he broke this law, he couldn't have a trial from his peers, uh, but instead of his subjects. Uh, Charles' instant reaction was, uh, on what authority are you resting me, bro? I'm the king, smug son of a bitch. Um, so since he refused to cooperate, he was then sentenced to death. Then he decided to finally speak and uh, got denied from speaking. Um, and the day before his execution, Charles actually told his younger children um, that they were worthless, that they should be uh, letting their brother rule because they're too stupid to actually rule. Um, so he was brought the next day to Whitehall Palace for execution, and in his last words, he claimed that he was a martyr for the people who he was fighting against the whole time. And it was like a huge threat, too. He goes, if you kill me right now, God is not allowed back in England. I'm going to tell him never come back here and let you all go to hell. And so they cut his head off anyway, and uh, when they did so, it was uh, it, there was actually a, a shock in the audience. They were surprised. Oh, my God, a king can... A king can die. Whoa. And so they actually, they had this groan, this overall sadness, which is odd because uh, they wanted him dead for so long. But England now became a republic. And uh, that was odd also because Oliver Cromwell becomes the quote unquote king. All right. So that'll do it for this lesson. Um, I think with these lessons, I might bounce around with topics because especially some of the ones in the 16, 1700s, I think are super boring. Um, I hope you all enjoyed, and if you could just like and subscribe, that would be great. Or if you could share this and send it around to some people you know, that would be amazing. I'm trying to help some people out uh, getting through college. Um, so yeah, if you could do that, that'd be amazing. Um, now that I'm done getting my master's applications out there as well, I will be trying to make more videos. So uh, stick around for those, and I will see you guys next time.